Hello everybody and welcome to this iMesh video. So it's been a while, um, I've uh, moved house, moved country and a few other things so I'm sorry for not doing a video for a while. Um, I was going to do a video earlier this week and then I got Covid so I was unable to do a video but now I'm, I'm like recovering and I really want to do a video so I'm sorry if you can't hear me properly but um, I think I can speak, I think you can understand me so I'm just going to try to articulate my words a bit better Hey, this is Editor Chris um, I know in this part of the video I literally just said I'm going to try to articulate my words a bit better but I've just noticed that I'm making a lot of mistakes in what I'm saying I'm saying the wrong word or not clarifying certain bits I'm just going to blame that on being sick uh, the rest of the video is like perfect, uh, just these captions please just read them <laughs> and they might uh, clarify what I'm trying to say um, but the rest the rest of the video is great um, so yeah and what we're going to talk about today is going to be architectural visualization animations or walkthroughs and this is going to be a critical part in your career I'm sure that some clients are eventually going to ask you to do a full animation of the final piece and as I've been doing ArcViz for a while, I've done a few animations and I want to talk about the top tips that I have for you so you can get started and make sure that you're making some really incredible animations. Some of the things we're going to talk about today is going to be everything from camera movements to render settings and everything else like that. There are some things which I haven't covered in this video, but I have done a few other videos on our channel which does cover animation in some sense. So if I haven't covered every topic, then try to look at those. But Animation is such a big topic that I'm sure I can make a few videos for this. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is have a project that we can work with so we can try to test out some camera movements and everything. We do have some full scenes over at iMesh and if we head over to iMesh and click on the scenes button, we can download any of these and you get the full project file. This is included in the 149 price. Um, so any subscriber could just download anything they like. If you don't have iMesh, don't worry about it. If you head over to um, 3D Warehouse and you if you just search for house there's a bunch of free projects files there that you could just download and just use any of these you'll need to then head over to github and download this plugin so that you can then import it into blender you will need to do a cleanup and the geometry might not be very nice um, but in general it should give you the basis for a building that you can test out some camera movements right the first thing on our list and that's going to be using storyboards so storyboards are a method of showing the progression of what the animation is going to look like um, so that the so the client can understand what the key parts are going to be. Now this is a part where you should ask your client what is going to be the most important part of the project. Maybe they specifically like a section and they really want to show that. Also there's a thing called a hero shot. Now a hero shot is usually going to be at the start or the finish of the animation or both and that's going to be the main part of the project which the customer wants to see. As an example here is a kitchen animation which we created and you can see that the kitchen is being constructed and then the final image is the final kitchen constructed and this is the hero shot which really sells the kitchen right then once you've got all the details from the client and you know all the bits that they want to see and you have the hero shot it's then ideal to do a few draft renders of each section so that they and then put them in order so the client can see the progression of the animation right so once you've created the scene and you have an idea of all the elements in the scene you can create the storyboard so if you have just downloaded a random project like a random house just try to find the key areas maybe add in a, some sofas some tables a kitchen or something really quick just so you can get an idea of the space in this case we have a ready-made scene so I already have some cameras set up so in this case I have for example a living room I have some some kitchen tables I have uh, some focus areas and these are the things which the client will want to see in the storyboard because these are the elements which you have considered maybe the best and maybe the client has said that they really really want to make sure that they have the main shot so then you include that shot specifically now what I've just done here is just made sure that I have enabled uh, denoising just to make some really really quick previews and then all I'm going to do literally is just find the camera I like and then just do a really quick screen grab of that and then that will be included in the storyboard this is just super rough you can let it render longer if you feel like it but it's not always so important because we just want to see the main elements so I'm just going to go through all the all the shots and then do some screen grabs maybe a bit neater than that and eventually you'll have a full storyboard of all the bits that you want to see in the animation and I'll show you how roughly how that can look in a second and this is generally the idea that I'm looking for just a very quick storyboard just to show the progression of the image so I would start off for example 
writing some information that might say, for example, we just start off showing a little bit of the animation, just some small highlights, some more highlights, and gradually show more and more of the of the image until we get to the final hero shot in the end. And that's all the information that we need to really say. You can then have a discussion about this with the client. Some customers don't really care and they just want to, you to send them all the images in order, number them one to 20 or whatever, and then they just want to check that they are happy with how the images are going to look in the end. But this is generally the idea for a storyboard. Now at this point I like to find music for my animation. I like to find music at this stage because I think that you can get a really good feeling for how the animation is going to go and you can feel how does this music fit to the scene that I've created. I know that some people like to find the music afterwards and then they cut up all their clips to fit to that music afterwards but I kind of prefer to do it before but that's entirely up to you if you're happy just to render like instead of 100 frames 200 frames and then cut it down afterwards to fit then you go crazy um, but at this stage I'm just gonna find some music from epidemic music uh, this is like a free no, it's not free uh, a huge library of music you pay like a monthly license but it's all uh, it's all just great music and it's just really easy to use so I found this song here it's just like a piano song and I'm gonna import that into blender now Right, now inside Blender, let's add in the track so we can see how it will time to the music. Now, I don't think there's a way to add the waveform of the music into the timeline, but it is possible with the video sequencer. So let's go to the video sequencer. I feel like I've seen a plugin that allows you to do that, but anyway, we could do it here. So what I want to do is add the song. So I'm going to click add and then sound. Right, so I've found the track that I like and then I've imported that here. And if I just use this, we can bring this down and we can see the track here, but we can't see the waveform and that's going to be really important. So I'm going to press N. I'm just going to go over to here and press display waveform. So now we can see at which parts the music is going to happen or change. So now if I press play, we can get, we can get a feel for how the music's going to go to the track. And I think that the amount of time it is between these breaks is quite nice and it's a nice amount of time to make each camera change. So I'm going to use these beats as my reference and then we can start uh, trying to set up some camera markers. So we know that the first camera based on the storyboard is going to be this one. So if I go into this camera, so what I want to do is add a marker. So if we go over to the sequencer and click marker, add marker, click on this one, make sure it's uh, highlighted. It's kind of like a little bit gray if it's not selected. And then just press, and then just press Control B. So now we can see that this camera is linked to this marker. So we want to have maybe this camera going for this long, and then we want to make the next camera happen on the next beat. So if we go over to here, we, can, we, want, we want generally it to happen at the beat. So I'm gonna find the next camera. And in the storyboard, the next camera is something like this one. So what I'm going to do then is click add marker, oh sorry, marker, add marker, and then control B. And now we have two markers. So now if I was to go to this camera and press play, we'll be able to see that Blender will automatically switch the camera on that beat. And now we can get an idea of how the animation is going to go. Right, now I know that the next camera is going to be uh, one in the kitchen. So let's just grab this one and just go into that camera and then just go to the next beat maybe just listen to this properly to make sure it is actually on the beat, but I'm just going to do this roughly. Marker, add marker, and then control, oops, control B again. So now we can see, we go to this beat. I don't think that's playing in real time. Right, so we could just see just a second ago that it didn't actually play on the beat. We could hear the music playing at a different time to when the camera changed. And that's because there's going to be some sort of delay or the frame rate of the of the um, of the animation playing on the screen is not going to be going very fast. The frame rate might be going at like 10 FPS instead of the actual frame rate of the animation. So in that case, we're going to need to make sure that we're going to be using a thing called frame dropping. Now, this is especially true on more complex scenes, on scenes where it's very, very lightweight. Of course, it'll be playing at the full uh, frame rate of the animation. Um, but in this case, let's just go back to timeline and then go to playback and make sure we switch sync to frame dropping. So now if we go back to the video sequencer, we should be able to hear the beat happen at the right time. Right, so that's so now if we watch the full animation, we can see that um, we can get a really good idea of the progression of the animation. 
Right, so what we want to do now, I think, is actually animate the cameras. So we know the amount of time that each camera is going to be on the screen, so now we can animate them. So what I'm going to do is select the first camera, and we could just uh, remove these. And what I'm going to do is just go to the first frame, and then I'm just going to press I, and then Location. And then I'm going to go to the last frame. Okay, this frame, and then I'm just going to move the camera forwards. I'm going to do Shift F and forwards like this. I've actually set that as a key bind automatically by going to view, navigation, and then walk navigation. And I've just right clicked and I've assigned that as a new shortcut for shift F. Anyone from Blender 2.79 will remember that that was the shortcut back then. Uh, so all I've done then is, oh, let's just move that forward actually again. Uh, let's just move that over here. And then I can press I and then location again. So now we have two keyframes. So if I go to uh, over here and I'm going to set this to graph editor we can see that it set up some keyframes for that animation now there's one thing that you should notice is that this is actually going ease in and ease out so that means that this is going to be uh, going slow speed up and slow down but we want these cameras to be moving at the same motion each time so it's not stopping starting before each camera there should be a smooth transition between all of them and that's going to be really easy we just press a to select all the keyframes press t and then we're just going to click linear now you can set this to do this automatically as linear by going to edit and preferences and animation and then clicking, clicking default interpolation to linear now every time we make keyframes now, it's always going to be doing to linear. Let's just click Save Preferences. Now that means that the camera is going to be moving steady throughout the whole period and not slowing down or speeding up. And I think that that's very, very important to know. Um, so if we now do the next camera, let's just click this one. Let's go to the first frame and press I, Location. And then this one, I want to do maybe a different motion. Maybe let's go left to right. So let's, um, let's just go like over here. Mm. I don't know why, maybe do something a bit more interesting than that and let's press I, location. And then we can see that we've we've set up some uh, the correct interpolation on these uh, keyframes. So now if we go back, we can see that the animation is going to be moving very smoothly from each camera to the next. Now this one is too fast. So if we see uh, this first camera is going to, is going quite slow and then suddenly we're moving really quickly. So the idea is that you want you really want these to be moving in about the same amount of speed so that it kind of makes it feel really nice. So what we want to do is we actually have the curves here and if we just grab this grab this one, bring this down, we can we'll, it'll be like a some less motion going on here. But the let's do the y axis as well. Where is that one? Uh, this one here, bring this one down as well. So a lot less motion. Now this is going to be, this is too slow. So let's just bring this up a little bit more. Okay. I think this one is, this is a bit better. So now if we listen, if we watch this whole thing through, we can see that this feels quite nice. All the cameras are going to be moving at very similar motions. And now let's do the one in the kitchen. Oh, we could just go through like this, select this camera. And now we could do the same thing. So I think this one should be moving uh, right to left. So let's do that uh, here. So let's go to the first frame and press I, location. And then we can go to the next beat, like over here. And this one already has some keyframes. So let's just delete this actually. Uh, okay, so that's, that's quite nice. So now we have the start of a really nice animation. Right, and now I think that we're in a pretty good place. I think I covered a lot um, in that one part. That was meant to be just for music, but I realized it actually goes quite hand in hand with the um, markers. So that's how I generally time my music to my cameras. And I think that it is important at this point. But the problem is, is that when you do render it, you are then tied to this song. Now, that isn't always ideal. And that is why some people prefer to do it afterwards because sometimes the clients will decide that they want um, different music. Um, but if you like, if this, if you think that this song is the one that you want, then that's perfect. Okay, so talking about camera mo motion, Okay, so talking about camera movements, 
I generally do prefer all of my camera movements to be very solid um, without the camera really changing motion during the during that shot. So for example, if I was to, um, let's add a keyframe here, I, I location, and then let's change this to, oh, let's just change this like this, uh, to um, Bezier, and then we could just move this up like this. I kind of feel like this feels a bit strange, so it kind of moves in one direction and then the and then the camera moves in another direction. This is very exaggerated, but I kind of feel like but I kind of feel like it's hard to get right. Whereas doing just one solid motion for each camera makes it a lot easier and you're not going to run into any kind of uh, roller coaster motion. Okay, so we have this camera. Let's say that we want to rotate this camera. Generally, I like to ro make it rotate around a specific point. So that might be um, this point here. So if I do a shift A and then let's add an empty, you can then make this just a bit smaller so it's not going to take up too much space. And then what I'm going to do is click on the camera and then parent that to the empty. And now, oh, I'm, uh, I need to add a marker. Let's add a, uh, Right, so now we have this camera and we want to, let's say, rotate it. And, but I think that adding it to an empty makes it a lot more elegant. So what we want to do here is just rotate this, say, like here. Then I'm going to do I rotation. Then I'm going to move this over here and do this one again and move this over here. I rotation. So now what we have is a very solid motion for a rotation and that feels nice to me. Now if you don't add an empty and you want to make this rotate around a specific object, you're going to have to go over, move the camera over for example like here and do this and then press I and then rotation and location and then go to the next frame uh, and do the same again. And that to me always feels a little bit off. It just, it's really hard, it's really hard to get right. Whereas if you just always have a solid object doing the rotation or doing the motion, it just makes it a lot easier to get right. But I think I will do another tutorial doing more complex motions, such as uh, the camera zooming in as a rotation or something like this. But if you're just starting out and you wanna have some really good animations, just go with the basics, really simple, and you'll, you won't go wrong. Right, so now we have the camera motions. We have some a bit more interesting camera motions. Everything's going to music and we have a storyboard. So we might be at the point where we already have the finished product. We know that it renders nicely um, and we want to start doing some animations, like rendering the animation. So what we want to do is play with the render settings. And this is going to be the tricky one because it really depends on your computer and you could be rendering for weeks. Um, because if you think about it, if you have a camera, let's just get my let's get my calculator out, and let's say it takes uh, how many uh, how many frames is this? So this is just this is just one, one, two, three. Let's say three cameras, four cameras. Let's say it will render to about this point. Let's go to the timeline real quick. This will be let's say 750 frames. I think that that feels about right. That's like a that's uh, 750 frames divided by 25. That's a 30 second animation. So that's about standard for a quick one. So we have 750 frames. Let's say that 750 frames takes 10 minutes to render per frame. That's 7,500 minutes divided by 60. That's 125 hours or uh, five days of render time for, for a 30 second animation. Now, 10 minutes per frame, I think is a good target to stay under. If you're going over it, then there are some optimizations you should make, or you should try to look at other, other rendering methods such as render farms. Now render farms can start to add up. Um, some render farms, depending on your scene, can I generally try to keep it under $1 per frame. Um, some render in about $0.50, 50 cents per frame. Some render in $2 per frame. But they generally try to keep it below $1 per frame, but it's, it's sometimes hard. So you can kind of see an idea of how quickly these costs can add up. So getting it to render on your computer locally is obviously the best choice. Now, all I will start doing is test renders. What you want to make sure is that in the compositor, make sure that you have the denoising node. I have this denoising node all the time and I don't use this denoising button because I feel like that doesn't do a very good job and I much prefer to it, for it to denoise um, afterwards in the compositor because it does a better job and it's a lot easier to handle and you can adjust the denoise level if you want to. 
Now, the idea with these animations, you want to find the sweet spot between starting to see the denoising artifacts and having your frames render as quickly as possible. So I've set this to 375 samples. If I set this to, for example, to 50 samples, that the denoising artifacts are going to be far more obvious. Right, so at 50 frames, we can see that generally the denoising art is doing a very good job at denoising, but if I show you how much work it's actually doing, so if I just plug in the original image, we can see that it's a very, very noisy image. And even though it looks good here with the denoiser, it would generally, from frame to frame, these will start. this will start to become very obvious. Now, in the later versions of Blender, this might not become a problem because they will be using um, temporal denoising. So it looks at the uh, frames around that frame so it can denoise it correctly. But at this point, we don't have that luxury. So I would generally try to render this longer because this was only one minute and 30 seconds. So I'd be willing to push this up even higher. Now, one way we can actually do this, I've talked about this in another tutorial, and that is actually to render the frame at 200%. Now that's gonna be four times as long, but generally uh, the, the denoiser will do a much better job at denoising um, frame to frame at just 100%. So that will immediately change our render time from one minute 30 to about six minutes. Now, it's really this is really hard to say because it really depends how long you have to render. Sometimes my computer is rendering non-stop for weeks while it's doing loads and loads of animations. Um, but most of the time I have to go to render farms. So I'm trying to think of the best advice to give, but it really is a sweet spot between the time you have, how powerful your computer is, and uh, how how happy you are with the denoising artifacts. What I, what I always do for every single animation is I do um, loads and loads of test frames. So I would do about 50 frames, uh, which is usually about two seconds, and I would render that out in different settings, and I would try to find the optimal level where the denoising artifacts are just not too much that, um, that I'm happy with it and that should be fine for the final piece. If it's a really big production piece and it really needs to be perfect, then I just have to bite the bullet and use a render farm or let my computer burn for, for weeks on end. Now the other thing to consider is actually frame rate of your actual animation. Now most of the time you can get away with 24 frames per second and it generally looks good. I think that's what most movies are. They're at 24 frames per second. So if it's, if it's, if it's good for them, then it's good for us as well. Because you have to imagine, uh, six extra frames per second over the course of 30 seconds is an additional 180 frames, which at say 10 frames per second would be uh, 1,800 uh, seconds or 30 hours of render time. Anyway, it, you can see that it adds considerable amount of time to your render. I generally render at 24 or 25 frames per second. Sometimes I go up to 30, but it's not always necessary. If, if ever, it's not really necessary. Especially when you, you're critical on time and it's gonna cost time and money, try to stick to the lower frame rates if possible. But there are some things which we should also take care of, and that is uh, in terms of persistent data. Uh, so under, if you type in persistent data, and you make sure make sure to tick that box. So every time it has to build build your scene, it will remember the settings and all the information about all the textures for every single frame. So it won't have to build it every single time. This is a huge time saver. So if you imagine your scene takes one minute to build, that's one minute over the course of 750 frames. So that'll be 750 minutes of time wasted simply by just clicking this button. Another one is that I always press, and that one is, I've talked about this in another tutorial, but while I'm here, if we go to, if we go to sampling, and then click on advanced, and I tick, uh, turn on this clock. I've gone over this in another tutorial, but I'll just go over this really briefly here. This is important to click, because every single time you render the frame, the noise pattern over the frame is gonna be the same for every single frame, whereas a normal camera uh, has a different noise pattern for every single frame. Now, as a final setting is I always, you know, if you're running on a GPU, you're limited to your GPU's um, VRAM. If you're hitting, like, let's say this says 7.9 out of eight gigabytes used, there's a, the chances are that your GPU is being used uh, to the max and it's gonna be throttling down quite a lot. So sometimes you might be rendering a frame that should take 10 minutes and it might jump up to one hour or two hours just because you're at the edge of the VRAM limit. So keep that down as much as possible. 
Um, how you can do that is just simply by going to um, it's going to simplify and under texture settings for render set that as low as possible again that's finding the sweet spot between how good your GPU is and how big your texture size can be it's just worth doing some setting uh, some tests at one at 1k textures generally you won't be able to see if the whole scene is a 1k render um, so generally that should be fine and that will save you a lot in the VRAM and finally there's also going to be your scene optimizations as well so if your scene is just very very complex like you saw we have um, tons and tons of trees all of these trees are made with collection instances so that it it calculates very very fast and this saves on a lot of resources on your computer so just try to keep your scene as optimized as possible I'm not going to cover that in this tutorial because I've done that in other tutorials but you can see that this whole beautiful scene with actually quite a good looking outside uh, was able to render on an eight gigabyte GPU. Right, so you think that you're ready to render and um, you've got everything set up and you found the perfect sweet spot to the rendering time to samples and you're ready to render. The first thing I would do is actually render at a really, really low sample count like five. You'll be very impressed at how well the denoise will do, but the idea is to set it up before I go to bed Hopefully most of the frames will be finished by the next day um, and then I'll be able to put all the frames together and see how the animation looks because you might be surprised at the things that you miss. So you, if you're just playing this animation, you might not realize that, oh, at this point, the lighting changes or something changes. Maybe the camera is clipping through a wall that you didn't notice. So it's really ideal, I find, just do a really quick draft render. And then you can also send that to the client and say, before I commit to this render, is this okay for you? And you can obviously send them some full frames, fully rendered so they can get an idea of the final render quality. Otherwise they will say, oh, I thought it would look better than this. But the idea is for them just to see, it. is the progression okay? Is the music okay? Uh, because this is about to cost a lot of money. And if you sign this off and it renders, um, then they're gonna have to pay for it if they decide to change something. Maybe they realize that this chair should actually be over here. I don't know. Okay, and then before you do actually start that draft render, what you want to do is go to is go to the output settings and set this to a JPEG. Don't leave this as an animation output because if it crashes in the night, you've lost the whole thing. I see this all the time, people rendering out with like an AVI and I'm like, oh my God, you're like playing with fire. Just render your draft as a JPEG and just get all the frames into a folder and then we can compile them later. Because if it stops in the night at 749 frames and then crashes uh, you'll uh, be very unhappy so uh, save that as a JPEG uh, for the final in, for the final render I usually change that to a PNG um, and then I usually like 16-bit like a very high detail PNG this does take a lot of storage but that allows me to do post-production a lot easier later at this point I would render it I guess um, I would press the render button so render animation and then we see how that looks the idea is please keep checking the animation because uh, you know you might still notice things are wrong and you don't want to get to the end and have to start again uh, there's a lot of uh, anxiety involved with animations if I'm honest <laughs> but the but the more you do the easier it is for you to recognize things which are probably gonna go wrong or not okay so how do you compile all the frames? And what I use is DaVinci Resolve. They have a free option, which does everything you should need. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is grab all my frames and drop them into here. So this is gonna be, this is a some frames that I have rendered um, and I've dropped that into here. If, you, if it is displayed as uh, all the individual frames, something like this, what you wanna do is just click these three buttons in this section and make sure that's displayed as a sequence. Now we can drop that into here. Generally, I'll try to make sure that the frame rate is the same frame rate as you have in Blender, otherwise you ha might have some problems. So in Blender, um, I'll just have a look. I have it set to 30 frames per second. So what I'm gonna do here is just click on this button, right click, click, clip attributes and change that to 30 frames per second. So now we know that everything is correct. I have had problems in the past where I render at a different frame rate and then it ends up becoming a bit jolty. And then what I'm gonna do is go to um, file, uh, project settings, and also change that to 30 frames per second as well. So everything is the same frame rate and everything is gonna work smoothly. So now we have the frames, let's just drag that into here. And now we can see uh, the animation working. So this is um, basically it. 
If you've rendered out all your frames and you have all of the markers set up correctly, it will just render out the whole thing perfectly fine and then you just add the music on top and you know that it will work and look good. Um, just some really quick tips, I guess. Um, uh, this is really quick and dirty, but if you just do a little S curve like this, you just add a little bit of contrast to your scene and you might want to also just add a little bit of uh, sharpening, maybe not too much. And uh, this is very rough. I'm not going to cover this in this tutorial, but generally this is where you do your post-production and um, make things look a bit nicer than they are. Um, so yeah, we have a finished piece. Um, I think that's enough for this tutorial. I think this is going on way longer than I was expecting. I tried, I think I wanted to keep it into like a five, 10 minute video, but I got a bit carried away. Uh, if this was useful, uh, let me know. And um, please like and subscribe actually. Please, uh, that'd be really helpful, especially as I've had a little bit of a hiatus uh, for the past five, six months. Um, I need to get motivated to get back into this. Um, and yeah, I will be trying to release a lot more videos uh, coming up. Um, of course, if you're interested in iMesh, you want to get your hands on these scenes yourself to use uh, and to see how to rip them apart and see how they're put together, then do check out iMesh. Um, I think we have probably one of the best offerings for ArcViz uh, furniture online. We have 1,700 assets now for $149, which is pretty wild. Um, I'm going to go to bed and uh, try to rest my head and uh, I hope you've enjoyed and uh, I will see you again very soon. I'm going to do one very, very soon. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye.